What's happening, people? Back with another reaction, back with another non-electronic music reaction, and indeed, we have now arrived at my favorite piece of music in life. Uh, which is to say, I like all different kinds of music. Uh, I mentioned before, it's not just electronic music, but listen to punk rock, hip-hop, reggae, jazz, all sorts of stuff. But classical music from the time I was a very young child has been one of my favorite types of music. Um, I grew up in a musically diverse household. Uh, my mom and my sister were listening to a lot of like pop and synth pop in the 80s. So, you know, Depeche Mode and Yaz or Yazoo and... Um, you know, uh, Duran Duran and a whole other, like, a whole bunch of that type of music I was hearing from a very young age. Uh, my brother was listening to, like, you know, Steve Miller Band and The Doors and, like, a lot of, like, psychedelic rock and, like, you know, sort of 60s and 70s rock. Um, so I heard a lot of those tunes. Uh, and then my dad, he listened to different stuff, um, but obviously, um, he was a big, not obviously, but... Um, to me, it's obvious. He was a big classical music guy, um, and I heard his CDs and records growing up, um, and then, you know, I went to a bunch of classical concerts over the years. We, we still do it today. Um, basically, uh, he conveyed a love of classical music into my brain at a very early age. Um, and although there are a number of composers I like um, very fondly, um, you know, so maybe some lesser knowns like Kachaturian I'm a big fan of. Dvorak, I feel like people know who Dvorak is. Um, but yeah, I'm especially fond of his work, not just the big ones like the New World Symphony, but Symphony 7 and his Slavonic dances and just so many of the tunes that he's done, overtures that he's done. Um, I'm a big fan of Rossini, the, speaking of overtures, the master of the overture, the overture in the Italian style, like what a legend he is. Um, but again, like Mahler, the, there's like a million people that I could talk about. Um, but yeah, Beethoven, I mean, again, Wolfgang Mozart, a huge fan. I love his, I love so much of his music and you know, he's a fascinating character. Maybe not exactly as his story is presented in uh, Peter Schaeffer's Amadeus, although there is a lot of historical accuracy in that. Uh, but Beethoven, for me, is my favorite composer. Um, his music just has this vibrancy, this life um, that other composers maybe touch here and there, um, but they don't live there. I, again, Mozart, I'll give credit to. Like, It makes sense that he has a reputation on the same level um, as Beethoven, because a lot of his works really do have this one-off, broke-the-mold, you know, lightning-in-a-bottle sort of qualities. Um, but again, Beethoven is my absolute favorite composer. Um, the Seventh Symphony, now all the symphonies are great, you know, it's, people talk about there's a few composers who have like nine or right around that number, maybe ten, maybe eight. Um, but yeah, and again, Schubert, I didn't mention Schubert, I'm such a fan of Schubert. But um, basically, the Seventh Symphony is my favorite piece by Beethoven, and the first movement of the Seventh Symphony is my absolute favorite movement in a, a symphony where all four movements are excellent. A lot of people know the second one, the sort of melancholy, the the, the largo, the slow piece, um, and indeed that one is sort of like really famous for being kind of like sad and, you know, um, brooding. Uh, and the third one is very light and bouncy, and the fourth one is just this triumphant, like, um, uh, rising like wave of hope and enjoyment. Uh, the first movement is a little more sonically ambiguous and it it eventually gets warm and like lovely and wonderful but it you know it sort of takes its time getting there and so on. Um, now here's the thing this piece which I began really listening to a lot in my late teens. Um, my very late teens when I first, you know, got out of high school and I went to college with a friend of mine, like we were in a couple of the same classes, we took a history of classical music uh, course and, you know, our assignments every week were to like listen to different pieces. It started with like very early, um, you know, the earliest musical, like Western musical recordings moved through like uh, medieval you know, or like Middle Ages music and so on. Um, and then eventually into, you know, the sort of classical period or the Baroque period, then the classical period, the Romantic period, so on. Um, but yeah, I remember when um, we were listening to the, one of our assignments was like uh, related to the Seventh Symphony, like later in the semester, um, and I just, whatever recording it was, I have the CD still, um, but whatever recording it was, whatever orchestra it was, whatever conductor it was, it was like a really good version of it. And the first movement, I just remember like listening to it as part of the assignment, and it was just, it moved me. I was like weeping. 
And then, so over the next few months, you know, and by then I'm already listening to techno, I'm already DJing, I'm doing whatever, but I'm still listening to classical music in other times of my day. Um, and the Seventh Symphony really grew on me, and especially the first movement, and it became sort of my favorite piece of music ever. So then fast forward a few more years, um, I met this woman, we started dating at first, by the time this happened we weren't dating anymore, but she introduced me to some Japanese entertainment, and there's a show called Notame Cantabile, which is about this, it's a romance story built around classical music and piano playing, because the two main characters are in the world of classical music and play piano and so on. In the live-action version of that show, uh, which is what I saw first, uh, the Be Beethoven Seventh Symphony, and in particular the first movement, is like the marquee. We hear all sorts of classical music in that show, but the Seventh Symphony, and in particular the first movement, is sort of the marquee tune of that show. And it's one of my favorite shows of all time. I love it to death. So that just drilled in twice as much that this piece that we're about to hear is my favorite piece of music. So yes, that's a long setup. I do apologize, but it's my first classical reaction. I had to give a little context on you know how long I've been listening to classical music, how many different composers I like, how many different types of pieces, you know, symphonies, overtures, concertos, sonatas. Um, I'm here for all of it. Now, I'd like to point out this is a Deutsch gramophone, a very famous label in the world of classical music. It is a nine symphony CD set. This is all nine of Beethoven symphonies. Uh, and a very high quality um, box set. Um, I don't know what year this came out. I'm gonna guess early 80s. I've had this for a long time. Um, most of the records though are still I think in really great shape because I really have not played them that much. Um, you know, it's easier to play CDs and with classical music it, it is a thing. Classical vinyl is a, a risky prospect. If it's nice and in great condition it's great. <clears throat> but if there is surface noise, if there are pops, you notice it a lot more than if it's like raging hardcore where there's so many fucking sounds that, you know, a little pop here or there, it's almost like you, not, you won't even hear it. Um, this is not like that. Um, but okay, so here we go. I'm going to flip it over. Symphony number four. That's number five. Wait, number three. It's out of order. Right, that's two. This is seven. Okay, so here we go. So this is conducted uh, by Carl Baum. This is the... Weinar Philharmonic, Philharmonic, Philharmoniker, Jesus, um, again, I don't speak German, and I don't pronounce, uh, pronounce German words all that often, so uh, apologies for the, uh, the poor pronunciation, but um, like I said, I'm a little out of my uh, wheelhouse here. Um, so this is Ludwig von Beethoven, Symphony No. 7, the first movement, which is a poco uh, soste so sosten... Sostenuto Vivace. Um, again, apologies to Italians out there who probably just like rolled their eyes and shook their head with such collective like sadness that uh, I felt the reverberations all the way over here. Um, but again, apologies. This is the first movement of Ludwig, Ludwig von Beethoven Symphony Number no. Seven, conducted by Karl Baum and the Wiener Philharmoniker. You don't know what that opening... I hear that opening and it's like coming home to the safest, warmest, loveliest place you could ever spend time. And that's where we'll be for the next, what, seven, eight minutes, nine minutes? you know Notame Cantabile, you surely just see Chiaki Senpai conducting the SKO, uh, the special orchestra. Thank you. 
Oh, by the way, before I even watched Notre Dame Cantabile, I became a big fan of Carl Sagan, and I made a point to get a box set of his Cosmos, which I had seen a few episodes of as a kid, but like, I was a kid and I didn't really understand a lot of what was being talked about. Um, then I saw it again in my early 20s, maybe like 01, 02. And I, again, Sagan just became instantly one of my human heroes, RIP to Carl. Um, and the Seventh Symphony is used very prominently in the Cosmos series, the original series, in particular the last episode when this like, hey, let's actually celebrate humanity for all our faults, we've done some good things and we can be good. It plays this piece, this movie. It's a celebration of life, this piece. If you know Beethoven's personal history, it's all the more amazing. I don't think he was fully deaf by this time, but he was on the path to it. But so far I'm impressed, like, vinyl's still in good shape. Not much surface noise, or many pops at all. The mom is conducting this a at a little faster pace than other versions I've heard, other conductors and orchestras. Boom, 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 boom. We're getting to it. We're getting to the part where, like, it'll test if I'm gonna be emotional. I don't think it's going to happen, but this part, and then it reprises later, and when it comes back near the end, it's made me, it's made me weep on more than one occasion. It's a celebration of life, as I said. I feel like this is the part where you begin to feel that as much as any other. part that Cosmos uses near the end. God, if you know the Notame show, I'm gonna get emotional because I'm thinking about Notame. like a little bit of a suspenseful feeling there. I made it though. You got a little like misty eyed for a second, but I'm good. He's just playing. Beethoven's playing with you here. And speaking of that, it's worthy of note that, you know, especially some of his later compositions were sort of like, you know, I hate using the word ahead of their time because, you know, they came when in the time that they came and whether that was prescient or sort of like forward looking in its stylings or whatever, it, you know, don't like dismiss that time because that's when it actually happened. But in the way that people speak colloquially, I do think this piece is, again, like his Ninth Symphony also, they're sort of like ahead of their time. Um, and in particular, this one, I remember reading uh, when I was studying uh, Beethoven and sort of the history of his music, that this symphony, which now has such a wonderful reputation, at the very beginning was seen as like, yeah, it's impressive, but it's insane. And I remember like reading a quote uh, from a contemporary music critic who wrote something to the effect of, 
this symphony sounds like music written by a drunk person. Uh, so it does make me laugh a little bit that, you know, it's kind of like that uh, Marty McFly, Johnny B. Good moment where, like, I'm not sure you guys are ready for this yet, but yeah, I mean, again, by today, this symphony has a wonderful reputation, but I think at the time it was like, holy, this is just crazy, like, it's just weird, like, what? <laughs> tension back into the piece a little bit. and like relative positioning to other sounds, which I don't know why my brain does that. I've heard some people say, no, I don't do that. I've heard one or two other people say, yeah, it's kind of like that for me. So I don't know, maybe just, you know, music interacts with brains differently. But for me, it's like, I hear sounds and they have motion and like shape. We're, we're climbing and we're building, but again, there's a, a tension, a, an intensity.
that brief moment where there's a lot of tension, it feels like right before a storm or something. And then that feeling dissipates, but... second climb this time. We're heading back to the main reprise, but like, I like how it takes its time to get back there. It was so glorious the first time, and you knew we'd get back there, but we've had ups and downs of the tension, and like joy, like dissipation of the tension, and now the anticipation does start to build. the ultimate celebration and embrace of life and humanity. Every time I think of Notome, I get like emotional because I'm that show. It, it's like my love of classical music, and it's really sweet and funny and well done. So seriously, like if you take one thing away from this video, go find online or otherwise because there are DVD releases of it with English subtitles. Uh, but there's also a really a much better subtitled fan sub version by Amrayu, I think it is. But yeah, Notome Cantabile, the live action version starring. Um, Wino Jury as uh, Notome and uh, 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 Tamaki Hiroshi as uh, Chiaki. But yeah, anyway, bottom line, it's an amazing piece whether you've heard it like independently or in Cosmos or in Notome or anywhere else. Um, I do believe it's been in many other things over the years. I, the sad movement I know, uh, or the second movement, the, the slow movement, was in Mr. Holland's opus when he's talking about Beethoven going deaf, which is a very nice usage of that. Um, so, it, you know, the symphony overall, is a, it's appeared in many different places, but this first movement, especially for me, the fourth movement has a similar vibe, it's very uplifting and hopeful, um, but it's a little more dramatic and like, like fire-filled, whereas this one, it's, again, there are moments where it has tension, but it's really just this sweet kind of bounding, like, celebration of positivity um, is the way that it hits my brain. And indeed, it's, you know, sort of in Notome, it is talked about in that way. I think it's referred to as, like, an indication of the joy of shining youth is, I think, the way that it's expressed. Um, so again, this might not be a rare thing. I might not do too many classical uh, reactions, or at least I'm not gonna like double, triple stack them on top of each other because I think it is gonna be more niche. Um, but let me know if you're here for this. Let me know if it is something you'd like to see more of because again, not only do I have some classical vinyl, but my CD collection of vinyl is like twice as big as my punk rock collection. I'm not even kidding. I literally have like 400, 450 classical CDs. Um, so yeah, I got a lot of that. So again, I realize this might be more niche, not so many people will be interested, but if you are, I would like to hear it and let me know. And if you have a particular composer or a piece that's like, hey, if you're doing this, you should do that. Let me know. Um, I'd like to hear it. Other than that, have a good day. Have a good night. I hope you enjoyed. Peace.